<laughs> so good. What's happening, everybody? So earlier in the week, I told you guys that I was going to be doing a podcast episode on orthotropics, but I kept calling it orthoponics. I had been studying and researching hydroponics for a bunch of different reasons, <laughs> but when I started making content that day, I kept calling it orthoponics, and what it actually is, is orthotropics. So if you look up orthoponics, you're not going to find anything, obviously. I usually am pretty good with uh, verbal stuff, but I just had a brain fart that day, and as such, I said it wrong during the preview content. So here I am saying it correctly. Orthotropics and what we're going to talk about is orthotropics from the Western medicine lens and then specifically from the Chinese medicine lens as well and why this matters, why this is actually important. Because I think with a lot of these things, the ideas that come out in the West, we want to look at them through the Western lens, of course, because that's how our culture runs. That's where we live. It is important. But then I think it's also good to look at it through the lens of Chinese medicine, which is more intuitive and abstract. So I think, at least the way I conceptualize the the thinking mind is that, <clears throat> excuse me, the East and West cultures are like the left and right hemispheres of a brain. So the West is very linear and analytical. We're very, very, very sharp that way. And then we have the, the um, emotional and intuitive. And we run towards you know, straight line linear in our thinking for the most part, but it's also critically important that we have that emotional, intuitive, and abstract way of thinking as well, because this is where they say true genius lies, is when the left and right hemispheres merge. And they think that da Vinci was eternally brilliant because of this. They think he had almost perfect hemispheric balance. That's why he was so well versed in the science and art. So the point is, when I bring these topics up, I always like to talk about, it from, talk about it from both lens because I think that's an integrative approach. And oftentimes, it's two sides of the same coin. And these ideas that have been around for thousands of years and what we find in the West as they modernize and research comes out, they're saying the same thing. But typically, we shut down on both sides. Eastern medicine practitioners will shut down because they'll say, we don't need the West, which I think is foolhardy. And I think it's equally as stupid. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've had a tickle in my throat for the past couple of weeks, so... Forgive me. Um, I think it's also stupid to go the other way and say that the West doesn't need the Eastern thinking, doesn't need the emotional, intuitive, or abstract lens. So that said, that's the way I'm going to approach this. That's how I'm going to talk about it. And so let's just dive right into it. Orthotropics, what is it? In a nutshell, orthotropics essentially is about changing the shape of your face and the bone structure of your face through teeth connection, and tongue position in the mouth. Now, we typically don't think about this kind of thing as changing the bone structure of the face. And I think when people hear this idea, and when they hear it in Chinese medicine as well, which fully stipulates that in the, the face reading context, Chinese medicine says your face does change as you age. As you get older, bones continue to move, ears continue to grow, noses get larger. Features change depending on how you live. So. Again, when we look at um, orthotropics, what they're saying and what Western research is showing is showing that when the teeth touch and the tongue is pressed up and forward into the upper palate, bone structure changes for the better. And there's a couple different ways to look at this. First and foremost, it's functional and healthier to have your face grow this way and to breathe through your nasal passages, breathing through your nose. Essentially, what orthotropics really points to and, and what they're big on is saying that mouth breathing is terrible for you. And there's a lot of research around why this is bad for you, but the main reason is that it changes the face structure for the worse. So traditionally, when we see people who are mouth breathers for a vast majority of their life, by definition and by cultural standards, we're not as good looking. Now, I don't think that it should be looked at through the lens of, of vanity, but I think we can all appreciate that we want, we want our best face forward for the most part. And what happens is when people breathe through the mouth, the tissues in the throat, the jaw, and the structure of the maxilla and a bunch of bones in the face actually recede. And what we get for people that are mouth breathing, for the, those of you that are watching this on YouTube, if I turn my head to the side, you'll see a tucked receded chin and the nose 
and the cheekbones will actually grow forward. So we have this from profile, what you see is a protruding nose, protruding cheekbones, and a receding chin. So it's not a particularly good look, and it's not what we would call a strong jawline. And so when we mouth breathe, this is what happens over time. Now, what they've found with this this field of study is that a lot of children who had allergies when they were kids were forced into mouth breathing because they couldn't breathe through their nose. And then it becomes a pattern. And then they mouth breathe for a very long time. The bones change shape. They're not as good looking. And the tissues in the throat get weaker, which makes you more apt towards sleep apnea. It makes uh, breathing more difficult because it puts pressure onto the throat. So what, what they're finding through this, this study is that orthotropics says if you keep your teeth touching and very gentle pressure, okay, not clenching, not grinding your teeth, but gentle pressure between the teeth, and then the tongue pressing into the upper palate in the way when, if you, right now, if you're listening, close your teeth, or I'm sorry, touch your teeth, close your mouth so your lips are touching, and as you do that, swallow. And if you swallow, you'll feel your tongue press up to the upper palate. So at the peak of that movement, okay, when you close your mouth, the lips are touching, the teeth make contact, and you swallow, you'll feel the maximum pressure that your tongue makes during that swallow. That maximum pressure of up and forward is what we want to keep because as we do that, that pressure, that consistent pressure, which they suggest four to eight hours a day, when you do that, the bones of the face actually start to shift for the better. The dental arch inside the mouth gets wider, making more room for the teeth, which is a big piece of orthotropics, actually not having to put braces on people because by doing this, we create room in the mouth for teeth to actually grow in. So by doing that, the dental arch gets wider, the, the cheekbones, okay, the maxilla, this whole area gets stronger, more defined, and as we maintain pressure in the jaw, the jawline gets stronger and we actually get what they call frontal face development, which means from profile, my jawline moves forward and the line from my nose to my chin actually moves forward. So we're not talking Cro-Magnon underbite. What we're talking about is frontal face development because, and this is good, this is what we want. This is what creates space in the jaw, the dental arch and the throat. When we have the mouth open and we breathe through the mouth, the jaw and the face grow down. We get we get length in the face where the face gets longer and the chin recedes. This isn't ideal. This isn't what we want. So what we're seeing with this course of study and with this field and this research is that orthotropics are essentially saying that with pressure, consistent pressure, the bones shift for the better. We breathe better. We have um, more space through the throat. We swallow better. We have, we're less apt to get sleep apnea and we are aesthetically better looking. We are, we are more handsome and more beautiful. So that being said, I think one of the big reservations when people hear this, there's a couple things. One, they think bullshit. Bones don't move. Bones are hard. But that's not true. Bones definitely bend, move, and contort. And if we think about this, we know from Western science that bones are piezoelectric. And what that means is when, when bones are under mechanical stress, they actually elicit or create a low-level bioelectric current. Quartz crystal does this. Silk does this. Um, our connective tissue does this. Bones do this. So it, it's a basic idea that, that they can put pressure. If, if they bend too much, right, we break bones and that's not good. But the bones do move. And this is why if we think of uh, people who have in the audience who are listening who have had a retainer, who have had braces like myself, you're given a retainer so that your teeth stay in the same position. Now, if you're like me, you stopped wearing your retainer for years on end. When you go to put it back on, if your teeth have relatively, for the most part, stayed in the same position, you'll notice that they have shifted some and the retainer usually is incredibly tight. Now, you, if you get it locked in and you push in, by morning, over the course of six to eight hours, your teeth have essentially moved and the, the retainer fits back in the mouth again with ease because the bones have shifted overnight. Now that's just external pressure over the course of one evening. So imagine in your downtime throughout your days when you are not talking, when you're working, listening to a podcast like this one, working out, whatever it is you're doing, imagine if you had this consistent pressure 
with the teeth touching, the lips touching, and the tongue pressing into the upper palate. That's many hours out of a day where the bones are getting the appropriate pressure that they need to create the space in our faces and in our skull and in our skeletal structure that we need. It's really important to think about. So if you can get behind this idea of doing this, okay, the other reservation that people will hit sometimes is they'll say, well, I'm like myself, I'm 38. So if you read orthotropic research, they say the best windows to get this an effect is from ages six to nine. Now people are like, ah, oh, shit, you know, I'm, I missed the mark. That's what I thought originally too. And if you looked up Dr. Uh, John Mew, who is a very prominent figure in this field, he says that, yeah, you're not gonna get the movement that you would when you were six or nine years old, and it's gonna take longer, but most definitely bones still shift. And bones can still technically move up until about age 80. After, after 80, the, the body just gets you know stiff and rigid and things are pretty much where they're gonna be. But for all of us under 80, this is worth exploring. Now, John Mew, from what I've heard, Dr. John Mew, who's, uh, when I've watched his, his content on YouTube, he has talked about how over the last seven years, his face has changed shape and has gotten better looking. Now, I don't know how old he is, but if I were to guess, he, I think he's in his mid 40s. So I think he might, may have started, give or take, in his 30s sometime, and has been pushing you know, this pressure into his face and he's seen result. So this is a long game. This isn't like your face is gonna radically change overnight, but by having this pressure on the face, in the upper palate with the teeth touching, we set ourselves up for success in terms of, of facial structure. Really important. So let's look at this now through the lens of Chinese medicine. As all of you know, I am a face reader. I am attached to a lineage within Chinese medicine under Lillian Bridges, who's world renowned for face reading and for feng shui practice and traditional Chinese medicine. That's her, her thing, that's like what she does. It's a branch of Chinese medicine, face reading is. So when we look at this, all right, there's some really cool ideas that come out of Chinese medicine and specifically in the lineage in the context of face reading. One of the things they say is this, we just went over that Western science is now saying orthotropics works. It changes bone structure just through teeth and tongue position. Chinese medicine says, yes, the bones can shift in the body. They can definitely change in the face. And Chinese medicine would say that the lifestyle choices that we make, the emotional proclivities we engage, the partners we, we uh, choose, the diet we eat, all of these things, essentially the immaterial aspects, also change bone structure. So Western medicine says, well, the logistical material pieces are teeth touching, lips touching, tongue in the upper palate, pressing. Absolutely. But like everything in life, yin and yang, matter and energy, there's two sides to the coin. And this is where Chinese medicine is really elegant and really powerful. They're saying, yes, those, those things are absolutely true. And interestingly enough, that alignment of teeth touching, mouth closed, breathing through the nose with the tongue on the upper palate is a foundational piece to Tai Chi practice and internal martial arts. And actually a lot of good martial arts stress this alignment. Now there's some Chinese medicine theory there as well as to why you wanna do that. But what I'm saying is that this stuff is intermeshed. If you look at yoga traditions, teeth touching, tongue on the upper palate, this is not new. They've been saying it, they've, they've known it, and I think what it really boils down to is that it, it creates the, the best structure for the amount of energy to move through. So if our facial structure develops forward, we have good breathing, we, we're gonna be healthier collectively. And I think over time, somehow, these ancient traditions figured this out. They, they could somehow sense it, or maybe it was downloaded to them. I really don't know. I still vote star people or aliens may have downloaded all of these ancient traditions with, uh, with their knowledge, but who the hell knows? I'm not here to, to speculate on that. But in any case, when we look at it through the lens of Chinese medicine, this whole bit about the bones moving, Chinese medicine has some really interesting ideas, and I'm gonna share with a few of these so that we can kind of look at it from a different angle. For one, Chinese medicine says the face is where the shen, or the actually it's pronounced shun, which is essentially the spirit of a person can be seen through the radiance and the light of the face. So in the Chinese medicine spectrum, in the lens of Chinese medicine, when you look at a person's face, you are essentially reading their spirit. Now think about this for a moment. If that, if that 
triggers you and you're like, I don't believe in spirit or that just sounds like new age horseshit, which, which I can totally understand. Think of it like this. How many times have we looked at a person's face, a family member, uh, someone we love, even a close friend, and you could look at their face and you knew something was wrong. There was an unspoken energy and there was an unspoken mannerism in the face where you could tell something's not going well. Something doesn't look quite right. We read faces all the time. Everybody does it. We intuitively get hits. Some people just look sad, even if they're smiling. And if someone is not smiling, we may say they look content. They look happy. It's a look, and there's something that's seen in the eyes. So the face, the complexion, is said that, for one, emanates from the heart organ itself in Chinese medicine. The seat of all consciousness resides in the heart. And that seat of consciousness emanates and beams out of the face like a laser beam, the epicenter being the eyes. So the eyes are ultimately where we see the light of the soul. And it, many of you have probably heard this said at some point in, in varying different ways, but the eyes being the pathway or the portal to the soul. When you look into someone's eyes, you can really feel a lot. And this is why pathological liars often, when, will, when they lie, they don't look at you in the eye. When they're, when they're talking to you, they'll look down. So a lot of psychological profilers will talk about this, that evasive eye contact is an indicator that someone is lying or hiding something. So the point is, I'm just trying to paint this picture that Chinese medicine says the spirit comes through the face. Now, when we look at this, we look at this orthotropic thing, this is pretty cool because what, we're, what they're saying is, in addition to our emotional proclivities and our diet and the, and the way we live, the, the energetic spectrum of how we choose to live in life not only changes the face, but also these material alignments, teeth, mouth, and tongue on the upper palate. That stuff, these are two halves to the same pie, two sides of the same coin, yin and yang matter and energy, both of these things meld really well. Now, in addition to this, there's another cool idea that's very interesting. So I'm going to explain this to you guys from the lens of Chinese medicine and then also Western so you can kind of have this more integrated framework. And it's just cool to see how Western research is sort of validating and bringing new light to these ideas as they as they occur as research comes out it's like wow there's variations of this that actually make sense in the context of chinese medicine which i always think is cool because i think integration is the name of the game here in chinese medicine you will hear the the the, the terminology the phrase of meridians and meridians are essentially like organ highways that run along the body so in chinese medicine when you get acupuncture these are not arbitrary points there, there are hundreds of points all over the body, and they're along specific pathways. And the theory of Chinese medicine says that organs have an internal pathway where they start inside the body, and then at some point they externalize on the surface of the skin and then traverse a certain area or geography of the body. Some channels start in the head and run down the body and end at the feet. Some externalize at the shoulder and go down to the thumb. They're all over, all right? But in Chinese medicine, there's this very key idea. And the reason I'm talking about meridians is to paint a very specific picture, okay? But I gotta plant this one seed before we go forward. Chinese medicine says that your, your constitutional strength, which is stored in your kidneys, and your postnatal strength. So prenatal energy is what they talk about before, while you were essentially in utero. That whole time frame is regulated by your kidneys and you're essentially acquiring the essence of, your genes are basically materializing into your flesh. Like the, as the baby is forming, their genetics are taking hold and they're being fabricated inside the mother. Now when this happens, this whole period is regulated by the kidneys in Chinese medicine, this whole prenatal phase in utero. And the second you are born, you now have to rely on what they call postnatal energy it means you're not living off of your mother anymore you're not living off of the placenta you're not in amniotic fluid anymore the entire environment changes you come out and what happens they smack the butt baby cries <gasps> and the the lungs turn on now we're breathing air we're no longer in amniotic fluid and the new game is what you eat breathe drink and think is going to be how you're going to get energy now from this point forward. So what does this mean? These two ideas, prenatal and postnatal energy, 
Chinese medicine says that they feed one another. It's a two-way street. So the constitutional genetic strength that we have that's stored in the kidneys, that kidney energy, that constitutional strength is nourished by the quality of the postnatal energy we consume. So the food we eat, the drinks we consume, the thoughts we think, how we breathe, those things, how well we do that, nourishes our core constitutional genetic strength. And as digestion, okay, if we keep digestion strong, this postnatal energy, which is regulated by the spleen and stomach, if we keep that energy strong, then that nourishes the kidneys, and then the kidneys will nourish the digestive system. And so what we see is that these two systems that have pre, that, that regulate prenatal energy and postnatal energy, okay, before you while you're in utero, that energy, and then when you come out and all the things you consume, that is like a wheelhouse. Those two things feed one another and it goes both ways. If your digestion goes out, you don't get to fully express your genes and your constitutional strength as well as you could. And if you tax your body so heavily that you actually deplete your kidney energy, digestion and how you how well you break down and digest reality and life and food and water gets worse. So why am I telling you this? Right? Here at this point you're like, what the hell? Great. That's interesting maybe, but why does this matter? In Chinese medicine, the stomach channel, okay, one of the primary organs where we where we consume that builds what, what they call our, our qi, our vital energy, our bioelectric current. The stomach channel traverses starts below the eyes, externalizes below the eyes, goes down through the jaw, through the sides of the throat, kind of passes over the clavicles, goes through the nipple, then moves inward a little bit, down the abdomen, down the front of the thighs, outside of the kneecap, down the, the front part of the calves, and then out our second and third toe. This is where the stomach channel traverses on the body. Now, what do we see? This is really interesting. Chinese medicine says that the kidneys regulate bone. So when we look at the face and we see changes in bone structure, what this really means is that the kidney energetics are going to be involved. So what's, what I find really fascinating, okay, is that the stomach channel runs along the jawline. And as we engage the teeth, which is gently engaging the muscles of the jaw, and we press up on the upper palate and put pressure onto bone, the bones actually shift and we see this relationship between the integrity of the face, okay, pressure we put on the bones actually changes the structure of the face, thus establishing the connection between bone movement or kidney energy and the stomach channel and the spleen feeding one another. Basically, as we clench the jaw, we're activating the stomach channel. We're actually feeding, we're pumping current through the jawline, through the stomach channel, and as we do that, the bones shift. So, while the Western lens just says, if you do this, Chinese medicine theory is right on point. They're saying, look, you're activating the stomach channel. And when you activate the stomach channel, that in turn moves bone. All right, when you engage the tongue and you engage the jaw, this will move bone. And so again, this is basically what Chinese medicine is saying, yes. Basically, engaging the stomach channel is going to feed the energetics of the kidneys and therefore the bones are going to move. This is a cool relationship to think about. This isn't something that is hypercritically important. I, I don't think it's, it's, I think it's interesting. This isn't meaning that you have to understand Chinese medicine for this idea to have any kind of weight. But what I'm trying to show you is that the theory lines up. Okay, in the East and in the West, there's something interesting here. And I think that's, that's worth looking at. So the thing I want you guys to, to think about in all of this, all right, is that the bones do shift and by keeping this very gentle alignment of the teeth touching, the lips touching, and the tongue pressing up and forward into the upper palate, we can change the structure of our face for the better. It's more functional, it's healthier, and it facilitates better looks, which I think everyone can get behind in some way or another. Now, the last piece to think about this, a little Chinese medicine connection as well, is that in this research I've come across, um, looking at the anatomy, Interestingly enough, our tongue starts behind the hyoid bone, which is in the center of the throat, sort of in the thyroid area in the throat, and the tongue is this big muscle that goes from there all the way out right to our lips. And so as we press up, we are engaging the muscles of the throat that push all the way up, and this is part of what moves the jaw forward. 
Now, interestingly, in Chinese medicine, what they say is that the heart organs, which is the seat, the heart organ, which is the seat of all consciousness, manifests in the tongue. The, the, like essentially, the energy of the heart comes through the tongue. This is also why they have tongue diagnosis in Chinese medicine. When you look at someone's tongue, you can see not only the state of the organs, but also the tongue is an extension of the heart. So what does that mean? Why is this cool? Chinese medicine says the radiance or the complexion of the face is predicated on what's happening inside the heart. So when we hear tongue pressure changes the face, it's basically that the, the tongue pressing up into the upper palate is the material expression of the heart energetics pushing up through the face and therefore changing the face. So again, you don't have to have context or, or training in Chinese medicine. All I'm trying to illustrate is I'm saying Chinese medicine says that the energetics of the heart manifest through the face and the material structure of the heart is essentially the tongue. And Western medicine is saying, well, if you press the tongue up and create pressure and you engage that muscle, it changes the face. So again, it's, it's the same thing being said in two different ways. So I think that's cool. I like, I like talking about like stuff like this and I think it's worth looking at. The last little bit to this, okay, we're gonna wrap this up, is th that alignment that we talked about, the teeth touching, tongue being on the roof of the mouth. This is absolutely foundational to Tai Chi practice. Now, when we look at this, as we keep these orthotropic alignments in our mouth, in our jaw, I've been doing this for about a month now. I've been playing with this. And what I can tell you is that my breathing has improved. I know that for sure. As I've done this, I've been engaging this alignment, teeth touching, tongue on the roof of the mouth, more and more as I do Tai Chi practice. This is an alignment that most people forget when they do Tai Chi. It's very difficult to do because in Tai Chi, there is so much that's being asked of your body, especially as a beginner. A lot of strange coordinations, a lot of body alignments. It requires a lot of proprioception and awareness to stay tuned into your body. So the alignments like teeth touching, tongue on the roof of the mouth usually fall by the wayside. But I've been doing Tai Chi long enough that the movements are second nature to me. I don't have to think about them anymore. So I'm getting to a place where this alignment is getting easier to hold. And what I've noticed is that by holding this alignment, my neck muscles, my sternal posture, and my upper back posture have gotten better. And this, orth this comes right out of orthotropics. They say if you do this, these alignments, these bones and the upper body posture actually improves because these muscles become engaged. We don't want tissues to be too soft or too weak. So what I've noticed is that when I keep this alignment and I do the gestures found in Tai Chi practice, I'm getting new stretching and new movement through my upper body. From my, basically from my shoulders up through to my nose, I'm feeling sensations that are new and different. Tissues are engaging as a result of maintaining this alignment while I do Tai Chi. Now, if people out there that do yoga or any kind of mind-body art, what this means is we want to layer our alignments. If you're doing yoga, hold this alignment. Notice how it's different. Feel how your body will have to work on something completely new, but while you're essentially holding this upper body alignment right in the face, the rest of the body, everything connects. Everything connects. So, you know, the, the, the ultimately, they used to think we had 650 plus different muscles, and what new research is showing is actually it's sort of like 650 muscles in one pouch because they, it, it all connects with the fascia. It's almost like many muscles in one pouch. That's more of the way they're starting to look at the body. So the point is, this was really stressed in Tai Chi practice. It's really stressed in Qigong. It's really stressed in meditation traditions. It's really stressed in yoga, teeth touching, tongue on the roof of the mouth. And it's not just to arbitrarily assign these weird esoteric alignments. There is actual, real, functional, there's a functional reason behind these things. And I think that's really important to, to, to realize is that I think when we study these things in the ancient arts, we can kind of get hung up that it's like, oh, it's just superstitious garbage. It, there's just these esoteric alignments and there's no grounding cord to reality. And I think in the West, we really need that. We have to see it from both sides to really get a feel for this kind of thing. So if you guys 
want to learn more about this, look up orthotropics. Look up Dr. John Mew, which is M-E-W. You can watch his videos at length, all of his lectures, um, the things you can do to basically change your face structure, and just realize that as you do this, you're fulfilling, yes, the, the material structure that Western medicine has identified, and there's also an entire spectrum of Chinese medicine where things are being nourished in the body, and there's, there, there are these other subtle systems at play that the average you know, Western mind just isn't exposed to because they don't study Chinese medicine. And just know that you're, you're doing quite a bit. There's a lot here in terms of how this can make you healthier and make you aesthetically more handsome or more beautiful. So it's a worthy topic to explore. I hope you guys got some value out of this. If, um, if, like I said, if you guys want to know more, I would say orthotropics is the best way to go about it. And if you guys want um, a face reading, please hit me up anytime. You know, I, I work with a lot of people and I, the thing I stress about face reading and the thing I, I really want people to understand is that I am not here reading your fortune and telling you I'm not acting like a psychic. What I'm doing is reading features and looking at bone structure and looking at what those features mean in terms of personality traits and lifestyle rhythms. And that's really where... For me, that's where face reading really gets interesting because when people, sometimes people's facial features will, will predispose them. It was just patterning. Over thousands of years, they thought they started to see people with that nose actually seem to do well in these lines of work. It's just trial and error and observation. There's nothing technically esoteric or really supernatural about it. It's just thousands of years of observation. So as I've said before, when we look at people's faces, it's like looking at animal structure, right? We can tell that a tiger has sharp teeth, it's carnivorous. We can tell by by its claws that it's it's, you know, it's going to bring down and grab, you know, animals. <laughs> the the form is indicative and representative of function. And that's something to think about. So, if you guys want to work with me on a face reading, just know that that's the way I approach it. We look at the bone structure, the facial features because they do mean something. It's true in the animal kingdom and we are a part of that. We are mammals, so it's a big piece of it. But when you understand your features, you can really start to get a feel for the geography that's most ideal for you in terms of land terrain, like where you actually do the best, like in terms of mountains, rivers, streams, meadows, um, dry climates, you know, wet climates. And then we look at personality traits. You know, big-eyed people are usually open books like myself, pretty forthcoming with their energy, smaller eyes. They hold their their cards closer to their chest and that's not bad but it's just understanding this and knowing how your personality flows and how it moves if you can understand that life gets easier and that's really what the name of the game is if you know thyself collectively things are are easier and more efficient and better so thanks a bunch you guys i hope you uh i hope you enjoyed this take care